very warm welcome on a nasty day uh, to um, our um, symposium, Mental Wellbeing, Spirituality and Young People, under this rather lovely title, Attentiveness of the Heart. Um, if I could just give a, a, a very quick bit of background to these days. I know some, some of you here have been to them before. This is the third one now of these that we've run. Um, and uh, um, it started fairly small and it's, it's grown ever since. So it's wonderful that you're here today. Thank you for braving the weather. This is um, a, a joint operation, this symposium, um, really between uh, St. Mary's University and uh, the Bishop's Conference Mental Health Project. And sitting over there at the back, who will wave at us now or stand up and jump up and down, is Gail, Gail Sainsbury. Uh, and Gail is, um, works in the Bishops' Conference of England and Wales on this project that's been running um, for some years now. We might say a little word about that later on. I'm very pleased to, to welcome here to St Mary's today uh, Professor Baroness Sheila Hollins. Um, some of you, I'm sure, in the room will have um, met Sheila or um, listened to her or read some of the things that she's written in the past. Um, Baroness Sheila addressed the Flame Conference, the big gathering of, of young people. I think it was at Wembley Stadium last year. Um, 10,000 young people there. And she was given 10 minutes to talk to young people about mental health. Um, she's um, recently been given an honorary doctorate at the um, Australian Catholic University, uh, where she spoke on the theme of mercy and compassion, fitting in very much with this Jubilee of Mercy that we're just finishing now, that Pope Francis asked us to, to, to have for this past year. Um, by training, she's both a psychiatrist and a GP, and currently serves as a crossbencher in the House of Lords. Baroness Sheila um, is also a member of the Pontifical Commission for the um, Protection of Minors, so works in Rome uh, in, in that connection and mentioned to me um, before, uh, just before she had a cup of coffee this morning, um, that at her last visit to Rome, she pressed the lift button, the doors opened, and out stepped Pope Francis. Um, Chida, thank you so much for giving up your morning. Um, um, Chida has um, a family birthday this, today, and so there's a family gathering this afternoon, so it's exceptionally generous of you uh, to be with us this morning. Uh, and I know we'll learn a great deal from um, the thoughts you're going to share with us. Baroness Sheila, thank you. Um, thank, you. thank you very much, um, uh, Bishop Richard, and thank you very much for coming out on this um, horrible, wet November day. Um, um, attentive, attentiveness of the heart. Um, I was thinking about that and how appropriate it is today, um, particularly perhaps because of um, recent kind of elections and referenda and so on, and the um, the way in which um, a lot of we're bombarded with a lot of um, kind of ideas and um, images of life and relationships, which are really not don't feel very Christian. And I think attentiveness of the heart, to me, means um, uh, we're really talking about love. We're not talking about, about hatred and, uh, you know, just not getting on with each other and not liking each other, lack of respect. And I really wish that. Um, yes, so basically, I think attentiveness of the heart is being, um, is being aware of love. And, you know, we talk in the church that, about parents being the first teachers of their children. Actually, to me, what the most important thing that parents have to teach their children is love. Um, and how you learn love is by being loved. And that's really what I'm going to talk about today. That's the essence of my, of my, of my talk. So, the year of mercy. Um, mercy, compassion, and empathy. There are three words which have very similar um, meanings, not necessarily the same. Um, and I'm going to have to turn around and look at the slides every time, aren't I? So Shakespeare um, and the Merchant of Venice, the quality of mercy is not strained. Now this to me is really important if you reflect on it. What does it mean? What does it mean that it's not strained? Um, and I just wonder whether I could persuade you to talk to the person next to you 
and just ask. See if you have the same understanding of that word. And then I'll, I'll come back and tell you what I think it means. So the quality of mercy is not strained. What do you think he meant? OK. OK, well, um, great. I don't know. I'm not going to have time to ask you. If I ha we had more time than I would. But to me, there's something about mercy, the mutuality of mercy. Mercy is not something that I do to you. OK? Um, there's something, there's, there's a two-way element to it. If, I, if my mercy consists of me dropping some money in a, in a hat as I walk past a homeless person, um, looking the other way, that's really, to me, not, not mercy, OK? There's a sort of mutuality about it. And that's what I want to kind of unpick a little bit. Um, the NHS introduced something called the six Cs. Care, competence, commitment, courage, compassion, and communication. And um, th this has come about because of in various inquiries which have taken place in the National Health Service, which have suggested that perhaps nursing staff and other health staff aren't as compassionate, aren't showing as much compassion as perhaps uh, we as patients, uh, the public. Um, and I would suggest the staff might, ex might need in order to be able to do their job properly. Um, and so these are, some of the, these are some of the things that were found to be lacking. And I think compassion and communication are particularly key. So one of the questions is, why is there a lack of compassion um, in human services? Not just in health services, but human services. Services where, um, such as uh, services which provide care for older people, or services which provide uh, care and support for younger people or for disabled people. I don't know whether you recognize any of the images on this uh, slide. Um, they're, they're taken from a film. It's a film that was shown on Panorama about four years ago. Do you remember the Panorama um, dis, uh, film about uh, Winterbourne View Hospital in Bristol? Wasn't that one of the most shocking things you ever saw? Um, an undercover uh, reporter with a camera went and worked as a carer at Winterbourne View Hospital. And these are some of the images that he, that he, uh, that he found. Um, so we see people with severe learning disabilities who have been admitted there because their behaviour was difficult for their families to, to care for them and support them at home, admitted to this hospital and subjected to the most awful torture and abuse by people who were called carers people who were called nurses. Um, and this went on. He was only there for a few days, and all of these things were seen in the time that he was there. Um, you can see in this picture over here, um, uh, somebody under a chair, somebody sitting on the chair. Um, they were stamping on this person's hands, pinned down. Okay. And there was another one of a woman put outside on a cold day and being hosed down with cold water because she had uh, wet herself. Okay. Um, a number of images like that, quite terrible. It caused quite a shock. Okay. It's been really, really difficult to change that picture because, in fact, there are 150 hospitals where people have been sent away from home, not welcome in their own local communities, not supported adequately in their own local communities, sent away often 200 miles away from home, distance away from home, in a locked environment, detained under a section of the Mental Health Act, and where um, I, I visited one um, hospital as uh, chair of a Care Quality Commission review. Um, the hospital has subsequently been closed. Not abuse, we didn't see abuse to this degree, but we saw, we saw a lack of compassion, a lack of care, uh, we saw practices that you would be shocked by. Okay? This is being videoed, so I won't tell you the, uh, some of the examples of what we saw. Well, how do we redress it? Well, one of the things is, for me, is that if you're going to help people to care, they need to feel cared for themselves. You can't care for other people if you feel that if you are working in a, in a culture where there is a lack of care and compassion. Okay, so that's an incredibly important first part. We need a culture which is a culture of kind of love and care. But also, it's quite possible that people become quite burnt out, uh, all right? We take our own histories, our own stories to work with us. We don't share 
all of our own experience, our own hurts, our own past um, difficulties. But on the other hand, we need to be aware of what we are taking and we need to expect people to be able to provide us with, um, with the respect uh, to be able to manage and the support and the supervision and the mentoring to be able to do a difficult job. Some of these jobs are quite stressful. So what we know is that staff reporting high levels of stress engage in fewer positive interactions with their patients. Okay? Now, I'm telling you all of this because I'm going to come back to young people, um, or come to young people in a minute, but I want to talk a little bit about um, mental health and um, what it means. Um, it's a long time ago, 1946, that the World Health Organization first defined health as a state of complete physical, mental and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Okay. Um, it's actually 70 years ago. And um, in some ways, it's something that the NHS and perhaps our society has forgotten. Um, when people talk about health, they usually talk about diabetes or heart disease, or um, they talk about uh, they might talk about stroke or um, arthritis. But it's very rare for people to actually, when you ask people to name an illness, for them to mention depression or anxiety. Um, and one of the reasons for that, of course, is that um, depression and anxiety, you know, have different kinds of components to them. They can be seen as an illness, but of course there are also social and spiritual components to them. What I would argue is that nothing is just physical or just mental, um, and nothing is just mind or just spirit. Um, that we are, we are different. But there's a, there's a myth going around at the moment, which is that we're all autonomous human beings. Um, in fact, we are social. Um, if we want to build mental health or mental wealth for people, uh, for our children, for our, uh, for our wider family, for our friends, we're talking about building resilience. And there are a number of components to resilience, and that's what I want to come on to, because I think resilience is the same, really, as mental wealth. So what we know now is that one in four of us will struggle with our social, emotional and mental well-being. Um, and that's a very high number of us. But we tend not to let people know that we're struggling. Um, and it's all of us. It's not just one part of society. Everybody um, in every uh, part of society or people from all sections of society and of all ages um, are going to, at some point, struggle in some way. Um, so it's not to do with how well educated you are. It's not to do... With, I, I've worked most of my life as a psychiatrist. I worked with adults with learning disabilities and autism. And it was often felt or thought by doctors and nurses and others that this group of people didn't have the same range of emotions as other people. That somehow they weren't going to get depressed, or if they did, that there was nothing you could do about it, because, well, they would, wouldn't they? Okay? So, um, unfortunately, people with learning disabilities probably experience more depression, that includes young people, and one of the reasons for that is because they are likely to be less in control, able to make fewer choices about their lives, they're probably less resilient uh, than other young people and adults. Um, however, uh, we're, we're all vulnerable, and to some extent, it depends on that resilience and the relationships that we, the, the sort of helping relationships that we've managed to create and, and surround ourselves with. Now, this is what I spoke to um, to Flame about. So, building resilience with grace, and um, here's an acrostic um, which spells grace. And I'm just going to go through each of these points one by one because this is fundamentally um, what um, helps us to build resilience. There is some research behind this. There was a huge project, research project called the Foresight Project. And um, this was an, in, an international project which looked to see what, the, um, what things would help people to keep mentally well. And um, I've 
put it into these five ways of describing those um, research findings because it's an easy way to remember them. So the first one, G, giving something, giving time, something you made a helping hand. Actually, everybody can give something. Sometimes people assume that there are some people in society who don't have anything to give. And it reminds me of, um, of a child that I once knew who died very young. She had very severe cerebral palsy. She never spoke. Um, she was dependent on her parents, her caregivers, for everything. She couldn't hold up her head. She couldn't feed herself. But she could smile. Okay? And when she died, 500 people came to her funeral because she had she'd given so much through that smile, that response to other people, okay? Um, and and that's, that's something really to, to, to think about. You know, what is it that each person has to give? Um, what is it that we value and can value? And we, well, it, it's fine to give, and some of us are really good at giving and really like giving, and this is where the mutuality of mercy comes into me. We've also got to be able to receive Okay, we ha and that sometimes takes quite a bit of doing. You know, if you like being in control, you like being on the giving side, you know, you might find it quite hard to receive. So the being loved is actually very hard for some people. And it may be partly to do with um, some difficulties that happened after their birth. It may be that mum had a postnatal depression. Uh, maybe mum really, sh maybe there were some difficulties in a, in a relationship. Maybe some other kind of thing happened around that time. Um, maybe a child was born after a stillbirth and it was difficult. You know, some of those kind of attachment difficulties that can happen after birth might mean that there is, that it's a bit, little bit harder uh, to be loved. Um, you know, it's, it's not that one goes back to think about why, it's just that it, it, it highlights the importance of that loving relationship right from the very start. So being loved, learning to love yourself. Jack Dominion always used to say, um, the first thing you have to learn to do is love yourself, because if you don't love yourself, who else is going to love you? Um, then you can learn to love others. Right. Then A, being active. Um, all of us in some kind of way um, can, can be on the move, can, 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 can be active. It's really quite important. Years and years ago, when I was first a psychiatric trainee, um, we used to go out into Richmond Park and take our depressed patients for a walk. Um, there's research now to show that it works. Uh, really, really important to get up and get out and about. Um, then C for create. It doesn't matter whether it's music, art, um, learning something, um, just going out and enjoying nature, it really doesn't matter. If you go, for, if you walk to the station in the morning and there's an opportunity to walk through the park rather along, than along the road, it might take five minutes longer, but it will do you a world of good, okay? That going out and noticing could be your moment for engaging with, uh, with, uh, with something creative for that day. Um, engaging. Engaging with life, engaging with people in the real world. And what I said to the young people at Flame was, you know, how many of you uh, spend probably more time on your iPhone, your smartphone, your computer? You know, you can't hug a computer. Okay, there might be metaphorical hugs that come through your Facebook friends. But actually, we all somehow, and, and it may have to be from a distance, but we all need to be in a relationship with somebody. <laughs> Um, that there needs to be somebody that we can have even a metaphorical hug a day with, okay? That engagement really matters. And of course, that's one of the big challenges for our society today is the uh, loneliness that so many people uh, experience. Um, there's a marvellous campaign on at the moment, Time to Talk, uh, Time to Change. Um, time to Change is a... Um, being led by organisations like Mind and Rethink Mental Illness. Um, and it's, a lot of it's about trying to get people to talk about mental health, to talk about the things that really matter. Um, so what do we need to talk about? Well, um, these are some of them. Um, grief, relationship problems, stress, 
people are better at saying, oh, I'm feeling really stressed today, but sometimes aren't quite so good at thinking about how that might, where it's come from, um, how it might relate to things that have happened in the past. We're not very good at understanding how something traumatic that's happened in our lives can have long-lasting consequences for our mental health. We're not very good at necessarily going and seeking help for that. You know, sometimes it's a good idea to go and talk to somebody. Now, it might be a friend, but it may be that your friends can't, don't, for, them, for their own reasons, can't really listen. If, you've got, if you're struggling with something and you go and talk to somebody and their eyes glaze over or they change the subject, you're not going to go and talk to them again, are you? Um, and I've noticed as a psychiatrist that when people came to talk to me, um, patients with learning disabilities, for example, that they'd be very nervous about telling me certain things. Um, maybe because they've tried telling in the past and people have looked so shocked at what they said that they thought it wasn't okay to say it. Right? So the sort of thing I'm thinking about, and it's connected to the work I do for Pope Francis, advising on abuse of uh, children and vulnerable adults, it's to do with the fact that most of us don't actually want to know that somebody's been sexually abused, for example. We actually don't want to know. And our faces tell it. And if our face gives a hint that this is too shocking, too painful, not something I really want to know, then nobody's going to tell me, right? Um, so um, that being willing to hear is something that even doctors and nurses aren't very good at. There's some things people don't want to know. And it's one of the reasons why some issues remain hidden, right? Because nobody is brave enough. And you don't think there's anybody who could quite actually bear what you want to tell them. And that's pretty hard to know you're carrying that burden all on your own because you think that nobody's going to be able to cope with what you've got to say and what you've got to share. Now imagine if you're carrying that around for years, and I've met quite a lot of people who've been carrying around an experience like that for a very, very long time, unable to share it, suppressing it, trying to forget it, and then one day, suddenly, something happens which brings it back to the surface, and a catastrophic breakdown happens and somebody is suddenly really depressed and needing really important help and yet somehow there's a gap between that knowledge of what happened maybe to a child and 40, 30 years later it, it actually really destabilizing that person's mental health and it's quite hard to make that connection and yet the making of that connection and the facing up to what happened all those years ago can be the solution to helping somebody move forward again. So the not being able to listen is kind of quite difficult. That's one example. Death and dying, of course, I and mean, all sorts of things um, which we need to talk about. I'm struck that there aren't many men here today, and I just really want to say to you guys who've come, this is fantastic, <laughs> all right? It's really important that you're here because actually men find it harder to talk about things and they may find it, many men may find it harder to listen as well. Now you people, you men, are probably different. You're, you're some of the ones who are willing to come and think about some of these issues. But there are a lot of guys who aren't. And so helping men to listen, to, to, to share, is, is also quite important. But there's probably a slightly different dynamic involved in it. So why don't we talk? Well. One of the reasons we don't talk is because, um, well, the people talk about stigma. Um, there's, I, I get regular emails from somebody who strongly believes that the word stigma is unhelpful. Maybe shunned and excluded is better. But if you feel different in some way, or you've had an experience that you think is different to the experience of your friends, um, then it's better to keep quiet, or that's what people think. And, um, and of course, if there's anything to any kind of discriminatory attitude, it can lead to fear. Um, a, um, a, a disabled man I know, um, living next door to a woman who objected to the fact that he uh, sometimes would go to bed a little bit late and she would hear him climbing upstairs in the next door house and he's a little clumsy. And so she wrote down every night that she thought that her sleep had been disturbed and the time he'd gone to bed and then made a complaint about him 
and complained to the Residents' Association that she shouldn't have to live next door to somebody like that. This was a private street. Somebody like that should be in a home. Okay? Now that's discriminatory, but it's led to that man being afraid, being afraid of, her, of, of the neighbour. Okay? And that's not helpful. Um, there was a private member's bill in Parliament to end discrimination for people with mental illness. I don't know whether you know, but um, up until three or four years ago, if you as a member of Parliament had a serious mental illness, then you lost your seat. You were not eligible to be a member of Parliament if you had a serious mental illness. And so consequently, MPs would keep their mental illnesses very silent. Um, and when the Health and Social Care Bill was being introduced um, in, two, in 2011, there, I, I decided to start a campaign to try to get mental illness and mental health onto the agenda because it wasn't mentioned anywhere in the bill. And um, nobody thought about mental health or mental illness. Um, four members of Parliament stood up bravely and spoke about their own mental illness. Phenomenal. It has so helped. Uh, to get attitudes changed. So we had a dis uh, mental health dis discrimination bill which was passed, which took away four discriminations in public office which were present around mental illness. And we ended up having mental health and mental illness included in the, in the Health and Social Care Act. And if I do nothing else in Parliament, I'm really, really pleased that I was part of trying to change that because I think it's important. We have something called parity of esteem now. So we understand that mental and physical health are connected, but we don't just want to medicalise mental distress because that's another way of distancing ourselves from it. Um, and I think more doctors are now recognising the importance of spiritual um, health um, and spiritual well-being as well. What increases the risk of mental illness? These are some of the things you would expect. Uh, physical illness, unemployment, um, stress, relationship problems, trauma, but also exclusion from society. And that takes us back to kind of Winterbourne view. There's a man who had been in a long stay hospital and um, the hospital was closed. And I met um, a now retired psychiatrist who had been a trainee of mine. And she said to me, she said, all those years ago, you used to go on about biopsychosocial. And we could take the bio and the psycho, but we didn't like the social. We thought it was very wishy-washy. But she said, you were right. And she said, that man over there, um, this was at a club for people with learning disabilities. He was in a locked ward. And I thought, this man, when we're closing the hospital, he will never be able to live in the community because of the things he did. He was always damaging his property. He was always, well, doing unspeakable things in his room. He now lives in a flat of his own and he's perfectly happy. And he comes to this club once a week and he doesn't need very much support. And she said, I asked him one day, what happened? What changed? Why are you okay now? And he said, I didn't like being locked up, all right? Very simple. He was excluded from society. Now he's a valued member of society. And at the end of the talk that I was giving to that club, I was presented with a painting done by this man. So the wishy-washy social in biopsychosocial really matters. We have a lot of uh, legal requirements in this country, um, um, which are aimed at including people, and this of course includes religion, so we need to remember that. Um, I, I, um, I'm going to move on a little bit. Um, if we think about the issues in our society that we don't talk about, I mean, it always used to be said, if you go to a dinner party, you mustn't talk about, um, was it sex, money, and politics? On those are things you're not supposed to talk about. You're certainly not supposed to talk about death and dying. And disability is not great either. Um, but I think there are some secrets uh, which we don't talk about very much. Um, one of them, sexuality, is one which um, I think we really struggle in our Catholic schools um, to really get right. And I think it's partly because of the word sex. I go back and say that it's to me we should be teaching love and relationships. Um, yes, of course, there's the biology of, of sex, but the love and relationships, sexuality falls so clearly within that. Death and dying we don't talk about, and that's why we've got so much trouble at the moment around uh, people trying to make sense of calls for assisted dying and euthanasia. Um, and uh, disability and dependence are really important issues. 
um, which are going to affect all of us in our lifetime, within our family, and in fact at some point in ourselves. Um, these are part of the whole history of growing older from childhood to older age, and they're part of our whole story. And we need to have the, the end of our story in our minds at the beginning of our story. So we are building for our futures, and that's part of what resilience is about. Sometimes we just don't notice, or perhaps we do notice, but we try not to notice. Um, I'd suggest that it's very important to notice what's happening to people. Somebody who maybe is not really enjoying their food, or um, they're, they're, they're wearing dark clothes, or not attending to their appearance, or maybe in this case where there's a young woman who's drawing a a picture and it's a, a black and miserable picture, um, not wanting to get up in the morning, um, many, many things. So I've talked a little bit about um, protecting our mental health, building that emotional resilience, um, friendship and family, all of these things that we've been through. Um, but I also think there's something about knowing the truth. And in some of our um, communities and families, we try to hide things which are unpalatable. You know, secrets can sometimes be more harmful and more damaging than knowing the truth. Um, even young children um, will often have a fantasy of a truth which is much worse than the secret that's been kept from them. Okay? So somehow that building emotional resilience is, by not dis is, is about trying to find a way to let children ask questions and answer their questions honestly. And getting that sort of pattern of truthfulness in relationship from younger childhood through the teenage years into adult life, and that honesty is what actually gives people much more kind of confidence and strength um, than being left in a, in a kind of cloud of unknowing. Um, <clears throat> So mental wealth is about relationships. It's about um, having space and support to reflect. Um, somebody, a Greek a teacher of mine, um, pointed out that empathy, I'm no Greek scholar, but the empathy means putting yourself in someone else's shoes. There's a, there was an exhibition in Parliament recently, and it was, it was a, um, an exhibition um, by a, com a, a charity called um, Empathy in Action. Uh, which was um, actually literally encouraging you to put yourself in somebody else's shoes. And they had about 20 pairs of shoes and shoe boxes. And they had, um, they had a, an audio recording which you could listen to while you were wearing that person's shoes. Um, quite a, an interesting idea. But what I would say is that it's very difficult to put yourself in somebody else's shoes because you're putting, your, you're putting yourself in their shoes. You aren't actually that person. So, and it's quite a jump to try to imagine, well, if it was me in that situation, if, if, it's, if I was my friend who's struggling at the moment, then that's what I would do. But I'm not my friend. My friend has had different life experiences. Um, I don't know all of my friend's life experiences. I don't know what's in my friend's heart. What's really worrying my friend? Um, and so there's a sort of kind of a, you know, you can't really experience that. Um, I, I struggle with this uh, when I first started working as a child psychiatrist and with young people. With young people, and uh, a mother came to see me with her child who had a severe disability, and. One of my colleagues told her that she didn't know why she was struggling so much with this one disabled child. Didn't she know that I had got four children, one of whom was severely disabled? Now, that was the most unhelpful thing to say. She was trying to compare my experience, but my life and my experience is different for all sorts of reasons. Um, I, I won't go into them, but it's completely different. Okay. So empathy is kind of quite a, a difficult thing. It's, and, and, and in that way, I think Pope Francis has done us a huge favor by talking about mercy. And how he's managed to preach every day a different sermon <laughs> on mercy for a whole year, I do not know. 
they are remarkable, the things that he said about it. Um, absolutely re remarkable. Well, okay, so empathy is difficult, but being listened to helps. And so learning those skills of listening is really important. Therapy helps. Um, well, it will help some people. Um, it's not something to be afraid of. Um, it might not work for you. It might be that you don't find a therapist who somehow is able to listen to you or enables you to feel listened to. Um, medication sometimes helps, but it really isn't normally the first thing that you need to do. Okay? Um, getting a tablet to try and help, help sort, you, sort things out may be an excuse for not facing up to some of the issues and some of the truths that you could do with help to face up to. On the other hand, if you've got a serious mental illness, it really isn't enough just to go to church and hope that a few prayers are going to sort you out. <laughs> you've got a serious mental illness, you probably need professional help. And that's really, really important for us um, in our churches to remember. I I'm going to give um, the last word um, here to Pope Francis because um, Pope Francis said, listening means paying attention wanting to understand, to value, to respect, and to ponder what the other person says. Knowing how to listen is an immense grace. There's that word grace again. It's a gift which we need to ask for and then make every effort to practice. So I think what he's saying is, you know, listening is a skill that we need to learn I think it comes from being listened to, having an experience of being listened to. I think it's connected to love. But it's also something we have to practice. And there are lots of ways in which we can practice it. Um, if you think about engaged encounter or marriage encounter, those are have a very central component to them, which is about learning to listen. There are lots of kind of exercises, lots of opportunities for learning to listen. Um, but listening, I think, is a fundamental part. And that's actually what a mother does when she has an infant. The infant may not be able to speak, but she's listening. She's listening with her eyes. Uh, she's listening, she's listening uh, to the, the response of the, of the, of the infant. Um, and that's fundamentally what a mother has to learn to do, which is why supporting young mums is one of the most important things that uh, we, we can do in our societies. Um, it's, the, it's, it's young mums who are actually going to create the emotionally intelligent and resilient uh, young people of the future. Um, and it's one of those, and, and that listening is something which we now know um, young people uh, listening to each other and some of the peer support groups that are set up now for young people are so much more powerful than many of the other kind of interventions that might take place in which young people aren't themselves in control of their lives. Maybe that's enough. I'm sure there'll be um, some questions that I know I feel sorry for uh, Junior now so has to respond to my ramblings. <laughs> Thank you. Um, my, my actual name, my Christian name, is Paul, uh, the same as my father's. Uh, when I sort of got to the age and became tired of being called Little Paul or uh, Paul Junior and getting to the height of about six foot three and being called Little Paul at family parties, family gatherings, it tends to get a little wearing, so that's uh, where the where the name Junior has come from. Uh, so just a bit of a brief intro into myself. I am a secondary school teacher, uh, formerly a lecturer of philosophy and theology at uh, Portsmouth College. Um, I was once a student at St Mary's University, uh, Peter. And I used to have long discussions in the field, uh, the field of psychosis, uh, especially uh, the intricate relationship between that and religion. 
Um, you may be wondering uh, what makes me fit to stand at this podium. I have questioned myself that uh, for the last few months. Um, I can only speak from personal experiences. Um, I don't claim to have a wealth of experience in the field, um, unlike some of the esteemed peers here today. Um, I can only talk on a personable uh, and hopefully engaging uh, level. So, as a bit of a brief intro, I'd just like to look at the following quote. Uh, so experience is the hardest kind of teacher. It gives you the first test and the lesson afterward. Something extremely relatable to myself. I came from a family, uh, an Irish Catholic family, do come from an Irish Catholic family. Uh, growing up, um, I saw large parts of my family torn apart by alcoholism. I saw schizophrenia uh, go unnoticed and undiagnosed for three, four years. Um, I have seen many uh, labels of psychosis being displayed within my family growing up. All of these things ignored, excuses given, um, until one day, an extremely sort of, uh, premature moment of maturity, I suppose, uh, I began to question these titles, I began to question these labels uh, that were given to certain members of my family. And really having that upbringing, it's really nurtured me. And I don't say those things uh, in a way to say, you know, get any empathy or sympathy or anything like that. And in actual fact, it's really made me sort of tougher as a person. And it's really made me fascinated uh, in the field of mental illness and mental health. Um, as a secondary school teacher, and for those of you that attend my workshop, I strongly recommend you do. Uh, it's going to be a joyous ride. Uh, we, we will discuss uh, ways in which uh, mental health as a whole can be raised within the classroom, how mindfulness can be promoted, how, uh, and we spoke, uh, the Baroness spoke uh, briefly about the use of phones and the increasing reliance upon technology. And although there are many benefits of technology, uh, lest we forget that students using phones, we just see them face down in their phone. However, uh, that phone could be telling them all sorts of things. Their friends can be on there um, passing on quite nasty, quite volatile messages. And they can become extremely distressed by this. Uh, I've noticed in my short time in secondary education that students, uh, a large part of their mental health is affected uh, by the use of technology. So something to be very wary, something to be aware of. Um, so. So, so the Baroness uh, spoke about compassion and it's something that I will try and use. Uh, it's a virtue that I feel that I have um, and it's a tool that can be used within the classroom. Um, again, relating it to the classroom, being a teacher. Um, only in the last couple of weeks uh, I've had numerous uh, safeguarding issues. Um, some of which I've used compassion as a major component to tackle these issues head on. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, and obviously because we're being filmed, um, I've obviously changed certain aspects of the scenario, names and what have you. A couple of weeks ago, I was invited and very fortunate enough to be right, invited along to a year seven residential trip. Uh, my mentor group, uh, which I love, uh, they're a great bunch, very mixed bunch. Um, we took them to Dorset, uh, abseiling, uh, crab fishing at night, which I do not recommend with 30 students, uh, all around 11 or 12. Uh, it, was, it was quite distressing for me, uh, but it was enjoyable nonetheless. So, first night, uh, we'd been there. This was 14 hours, including a four-hour coach journey um, from Swindon to Dorset. Um, we got to the year seven, year seven uh, camp. Uh, when I say camp, it was more like a sort of hostel, uh, so to speak. Uh, so uh, I was sharing a dorm uh, with a colleague of mine. And at 11 o'clock that night, a fire alarm went off. 
So we marched down to the playground with uh, 180 students knocking on their doors, getting them to the playground. Had them on the playground half an hour lining up in late October conditions, so quite chilly. Brought them back into the dorms, got ourselves settled back down again. Very tiring days, you can imagine already. So at half past one that morning, uh, we had a knock on the door. Uh, open the door to a year 11, uh, year 7 student. Uh, Open the door to him. Um, I said, are you okay? He'd been crying a lot that day, quite distressed. Uh, he hadn't slept at all. So we, we sort of, you know, offered some explanations, offered some reassurance, said, you know, it's just a few hours you've got to get through, just a few more hours, remember that. Half past two in the morning, another dog, knock at the door, same student. Half past three, another knock on the door, the same student. So this happened throughout the night. When it got to half past four in the morning, uh, I sat there with him for about an hour and a half uh, as he was sort of crying his eyes out. And I recognised that he had an interest in British politics. Very unusual for a year seven student. And from what I've witnessed, politics is not uh, something you'd necessarily associate with students' interest between key stage three and key stage four. Uh, but I recognised that from a previous lesson that I'd had with him. And we sat there on the stairs together for an hour and a half. No sleep, nothing. Um, and we spoke about uh, the last 100 years, of, uh, 100 years of British politics. We spoke about Brexit. Now, this child had been diagnosed with quite severe anxiety issues. This wasn't one of his strategies. This wasn't an action plan that was in place by any stretch of the imagination. However, in that moment of time, it was enough um, to provide some sense of reassurance. The repetitive nature of recalling and recanting uh, different prime ministers throughout the last 100 years seemed to work as an effective strategy. He went back to bed and he slept soundly for the rest of the night. Uh, just a bit of a insight into virtues that we all have and playing on perhaps interests and using compassion as a tool. We all have it as a virtue and although even if you've experienced a night without any sleep, uh, it can still be there. You can still find it. So empathy and again fitting yourself into somebody else's shoes. Um, and again, in a year nine class, and year nines for anyone that, if you are a teacher in this room or you have any experience of education, you will find that year nine students are the most closed off, uh, the most uh, aggravated, the most sort of contentious, uh, the most uh, in uh, at times spiteful students that you can have. But they do have a loving and they do have a caring heart. Um, when in preparation for this, I kind of got some views uh, from the students with regards to mental health and mental illness, and they shared their views on it. I made it anonymous, um, and one of the girls came up to me at the end of the lesson, and she said, Sir, uh, in a few weeks' time, can you, and you can do it subtly, uh, bring up depression within a lesson? Um, so I didn't ask any questions, I didn't probe, um, I just simply said, yeah, I, I will. Um, and in every other lesson, I will try to eradicate existing sort of taboos uh, surrounding mental illness in particular. Um, I don't want titles branded around like crazy or insane, which some year nine students will rely on as a key part of their terminology to describe uh, somebody perhaps when they raise ideas that they don't agree with. So it's about getting rid of those existing taboos uh, wherever we can in society. Um, in these year nine lessons, um, when I sort of got some work back from them and when they'd spent five minutes just writing their impressions of mental health and giving a bit of an insight into their view of it. It was very wide ranging. Some of them seemed to have quite a clear insight into what mental health consisted of, um, what their views on it were. Some of them, uh, I won't go into too much detail about them, uh, but perhaps 
they needed to, uh, their minds need to be just crafted and perhaps cultivated and perhaps guided uh, into the direction that we want them to be in. Now, on Monday, I am being observed um, as part of a whole school review, almost in preparation for Ofsted. Um, as part of our lesson plans, uh, we have to promote British values. Uh, we have to um, promote literacy and numeracy, which, uh, believe me, in a religious studies lesson can be quite difficult at times to uh, get in uh, numeracy, uh, but it is possible. Um, However, there is nothing on there that says we should be prom promoting mindfulness in every other lesson. And I've adapted a symbol for mindfulness, um, to which it's kind of an evolution of the uh, surfer symbol that you might have seen, uh, like that. Um, for me and my students, uh, in mindfulness, if they are misguided or perhaps they aren't demonstrating mindfulness, um, I will simply give them a symbol, an upside down uh, M, and say, is that mindfulness? Are you demonstrating mindfulness right now? That's my, that's my teachery voice right there. Um, okay. Um, so, mercy and mindfulness. Um, so mindfulness, and again, this can be promoted in all aspects of life. Uh, and leading to what the Baroness said earlier about, you know, if you, is it mercy if you walk past somebody in the street and simply throw change into their bucket without actually looking at them? In the same way, if a student walks into my classroom looking upset, or they look like they haven't slept, or they look in some sort of distress, me saying, are you okay? And then they say, yeah, I'm fine. And then I walk off and turn my back on them. That is not just demonstrating mercy or mindfulness. In fact, I should uh, keep an eye on them, um, and I do have an open door policy, and although at some points I do have students from year 10, 11, 12, 13, 7, 8, all of the years lining up at my door at lunchtime to come and speak to me, I can rest easy thinking that I am playing a part in this school. I am trying to promote mindfulness. So, I did, I did warn you, I do ramble on, so we will come to the conclusion of this. <clears throat> so, in my naivety, um, when I was going around my school and asking uh, varying uh, teachers uh, what their experience is of promoting uh, good mental health and mindfulness and mercy within the classroom was, um, I didn't stop to think how these teachers might personally have been affected by perhaps mental illness or that they might have personal views on mental health themselves. So the very first teacher that I spoke to, I said, oh, I'm, I'm doing this talk in a few weeks. Do you have any perspectives, experiences, views on it? Uh, and she turned around and said, oh, I've got an absolute full catalogue of it. Uh, my mother uh, suffered from depression for four years. Um, and it's ongoing, and um, she was actually received medication after four years for it. Uh, and she said that she was experiencing this during her PGCE, which greatly affected uh, the teacher that was put in front of the class. Um, there are countless examples that I could use of teachers who are currently experiencing, um, who are, sorry, experiencing uh, family that may have uh, mental illness, and they come in the next day uh, and they have to stand in front of 30 students and they have to be the centre of positivity. They have to promote a positive aura in front of the class. Um, students prey on weakness. If you go in and your head is down and you start mumbling in front of the class, that lesson will not go well. So it's just about recognising that. So just going back to the symbols here, and I'll, I'll touch upon this very briefly. So these are sort of social networking sites, dating sites, what have you. And it got me thinking to the way in which we sometimes subliminally categorize friends. So we can say old school friends, old university friends, work friends, they're all put in categories. Um, these, these networking sites, these websites behind me, 
Um, you can meet people from all walks of life, randomised. You can meet these people. Which got me thinking that perhaps uh, a scheme could be set up in school, and I know some schools are working on them, to get teachers to talk. So getting teachers to talk. Uh, this is a pilot scheme which I'm trying to promote in the school in which I work in, uh, trying to get um, teachers to just spend one hour a week, and I've said that I'm happy to chair it, to get teachers to sit around for one hour a week from all different departments. Believe it or not, I don't tend to talk to people from the PE department or the art department because they're about half a mile over the other side of the school. But just meeting up once a week, um, promoting mindfulness, just discussing anything, uh, discussing what films have come out recently, discussing a favourite music, just creating more of a communal sense within a school. Teachers can be lone wolves. They go off into their different departments and for that whole day they will just talk to students. And it's about having a support network. It's about having a support system within schools which if there's, this goes any way to helping a teacher be a better teacher and being able to stand in front of the school with positivity and feel that they're not alone, um, then that can only be a good thing. Uh, so I'd just like to end with that there. Um, I will go into this in a bit more detail in the workshop and things like that for any of you that are interested. And again, apologies for my rambling nature, uh, but it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you um, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.